Thank you. Um, again, we're going to, because we have some time constraints, uh, we're going to jump right into um, to our afternoon session. Um, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing to you Dr. Mark David Milliron. Okay, and I want to share with you some, some of the information I have here about Dr. Milliron. He was recently named Chancellor of WGU Texas, a nonprofit university founded by the state of Texas dedicated to providing affordable, accredited, and high quality online and blended degree programs in high demand fields. Prior to taking the position, he served as Deputy Director of Post-Secondary Improvement with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, leading efforts to increase student success in the U.S. post-secondary education sector. He is an award-winning leader, author, speaker, and consultant well-known for exploring leadership development, future trends, learning strategies, and the human side of tech technology change. He has worked with universities, community college, K-12 schools, corporations, associations, and government agencies across the country and around the world. He also serves on numerous corporate, nonprofit, and education bo boards and advisory groups. In, uh, in advisory groups, he's also been the recipient of numerous awards. And it is my pleasure to introduce again. This is Dr. Mark David Milliron. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for letting me join the conversation. It sounds like you have been diving into a dialogue around educational improvement um, that is deeply meaningful to you. And it, it's, I'm glad to join in that conversation because what I want to do today is to actually plug this conversation into a set of larger catalytic conversations that are happening around education uh, nationally and some internationally. Uh, and, and hopefully point you to some resources you might want to steal and ideas you might want to think about. But most importantly, to talk about the notion of um, continuing the catalytic conversation, realizing the work of this commission is to continue driving conversations to drive what I would what I'll kind of call in the close, a crawl, walk, run strategy in driving the kind of change that you're looking to, uh, to try to drive in this local community. What I'm going to try to do is frame about seven major conversations, and these are conversations that, again, that are your friends and neighbors from all across the country and around the world. Uh, what I would say from working in the education community, the philanthropic community, the foundation community, more broadly in the work in government, these are seven of the most catalytic conversations, the ones that are, that are driving some of the most substantive changes um, in education infrastructure and, and application. There are conversations around completion, around the swirl and blend of our infrastructures, about contextual and simulation-based learning, in particular game-based learning, um, the radical changes we're seeing in learning resources, the, the use of analytics and data in more strategic ways, um, the kind of convergence around the importance of non-cognitive research and non-cognitive factors in educational attainment, uh, and this real focus on getting students ready uh, and having education be this pathway to possibility for our students. Um, a little bit about my own perspective on this journey, um, a little bit about my own background. I come from a family of nine children. Um, I actually have an African-American brother, a Native American brother, and a Korean sister. In addition to that, we had 25 foster, parents, foster kids who rotated through my house during the time I was growing up. My mom was a special needs nurse and my dad was out of his mind. <laughs> so we had a big and rowdy and diverse household growing up. Uh, and I was the first in my family to go through into higher ed and, uh, and had to learn a lot of lessons when I was on that journey. Um, and I'll talk about that in a bit, but I want to use a quick metaphor about our student learning journeys right now because it struck me a few weeks ago when I was coming back from our Christmas vacation with my existing family. Um, I was thinking about how different the road trips my family takes today are from the road trips I took as a kid growing up. Because a road trip for my big rowdy family, as you can imagine, involved a station wagon and going across country. And the idea of the road trip sounded really exciting for the first, you know, as we were thinking about it, but then you got in the car and after about 15 minutes, that road trip was no longer exciting, right? Mm -hmm. 
And, and when we got in the car, the smartest thing you could get big station wagon, no seat belt, seat belt for bouncing around all over the place. The smartest thing you could do was sit as far back in the station wagon as possible so when dad turned around, he couldn't reach you, right? Um, but it, very, very different. And why I thought about it, why it really struck me was we were driving, my, my family, I have four kids right now. I have a 14-year-old daughter, 13-year-old son, 9-year-old son, and a 4-year-old son. Um, and our road trips consist of piling four kids, two dogs, a bird into a minivan and driving from Western North Carolina back to Austin, Texas. We usually go back to Western North Carolina for our, um, our Christmas vacations and some of our other holidays. We go back out to see our family at least four or five times a year. It's a 20 hour drive. We drive it straight through. We have learned that trying to stop along the way is a nightmare, especially if you've got two dogs trying to hide a dog in a blanket, pretend it's a baby. They think it's a really ugly baby. It doesn't work. You just got to make, make your way to go through. So we just plow all the way through. And where it really struck me is at one moment, the kids were arguing about which movie was playing in the minivan. And I just thought about how different their trip was. And then I just sat back and watched for a second. And, and again, just really different. I come from, again, large, low-income background with very different experiences. But the road trip principles were there. We had a destination. We knew where we wanted to go. We had a set of tools and techniques that would get us from point A to point B. Um, now, as we pile into that minivan and drive across country, it's a different experience. Um, the first thing we do when we get into the car is to plug the address into what? A GPS system. I was at an educational conference in the late 1990s when somebody was talking about the coming GPS systems, and we were actually running that education conference. And at the end, 4,000 people were at that event, and we were looking at the evaluations, and they all said, we loved that guy. He was funny. He was really interesting. And talking about this new cutting-edge technology, but for the love of God, never have us somebody present to us again that is that impractical. We are never going to see something like that in our lifetime. How many of you have used a GPS system in the last day? Yeah, Stacia and I used it to get here, right? <laughs> as we used to get here. Again, the change that has come. And as I sat back, and we were driving, um, we were actually driving through Tennessee at this point. I, I sat back and watched my wife manage re-entry for our four kids into Austin. We've been gone for three weeks. She's managing the re-entry of the kids back into school and all their activities with her iPhone. She's made five calls, sent texts, three email messages, all back and forth, all with one device. My four-year-old is on an iPad doing Montessori games. My 14-year-old daughter, who was just this ridiculously voracious reader, we ended up having to get her a Nook because she was breaking us by going to the bookstore as much as she was going. So she's reading a Nook book. And then my two sons are in the very back of the van playing a synced DS game against each other. And I'm thinking to myself, this is not the license plate game, <laughs> right? This is a very different journey for these kids. And in fact, at one point, they convinced my wife to turn on her iPhone as a personal hotspot, and three of them got synced up with their DS and got online um, and, and with the iPad, and they were playing Minecraft with friends in Washington and Texas while we were driving through Tennessee. Okay. Just a very different road trip for them. Now, I don't begrudge them that. And by the way, you think it's all technology and some kind of dystopic people all away from it. No, it's also people having to work with people. In fact, it's coordinated. When we stop at a gas station, that 20-hour trip can turn into a 30-hour trip like that, right? Because if we stop at a gas station and it goes south, we could end up there for at least 20 minutes or longer. So one of the things we've learned, it's, it's like our gas station stops are like a NASCAR stop, man. We pull in and, like, and I get the gas. My wife takes the dogs to go to the bathroom. There's kids pair up two by two, they go into there, they know they can go to the bathroom, get one candy, I meet in, pay for the candy, drive around, pick up my wife, and we're out of there. I mean, it's down to an absolute science. So it's this interaction of high tech, high touch, and this kind of cooperation activity. And why I bring it up, because I want to talk about how different student learning journeys are today than they used to be. And I think we've got to, in some ways, take a step back and be okay with the difference in those learning journeys. Because our infrastructure 20, 30, 40 years ago was preparing students for a different kind of destination with a different set of tools and techniques and technologies. Most of our teachers and learners today, most of our teachers and reachers especially, and leaders, are teaching and reaching kids with tools and technologies and techniques they didn't experience as learners. And so one of the things we have to think about is how all that comes together. And in particular, thinking about the destination. Let's talk about the completion agenda that's happening around this country. There is something um, profound about the confluence of conversations around helping more students move through a post-secondary credential. And, and I want to just want to talk a little bit about the data around this. Um, having worked at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I can tell you with great clarity that that foundation is focused on the mission of helping students, helping people have the chance to live healthy and productive lives. 
Internationally, that plays out in global health and global development. In the U.S., that plays out in education, in particular because of some key data that really hit Bill and Melinda between the eyes, which is the data that the intergenerational transmission of poverty has never been higher than it is right now in the United States, which means you've never been more likely to die poor if you were born poor. Anybody else see that as a problem? Yeah. The single biggest disintermediator of that cycle is education. It used to be a K-12 education. It is not a K-12 education anymore. It is now, and this is the phrase that counts, it is a post-secondary credential with labor market value. Notice I did not say a college degree for all. I said a post-secondary credential with labor market value. That is apprenticeships, certifications, diplomas, and degrees that are offered by the family of institutions in the post-secondary space that sync with your K-12 systems and that you're, you're launching your students towards. The problem is people want to conflate that with everybody should get a four-year degree. That is not what we're talking about. We're talking about people on different pathways to possibilities with different kinds of credential opportunities for them to come out. Does that make sense? Our problem is the post-secondary credential with labor market value doesn't fit neatly on a bumper sticker. It just doesn't. And it's part of the problem in this conversation. But what we know is that we have done a, an incredible job in this country of opening up access to higher education. We have democratized education again and again. In fact, anybody who tells you higher education hasn't changed or education in general hasn't changed in the last 200 years doesn't know what they're talking about. We invented land-grant institutions, universal high school, junior colleges, technical colleges, community colleges, for-profit institutions, early college high schools, just in the last 200 years, all because of social and economic innovation needs. The challenge we have is we now have to bring that same focus to act, not that we've brought into access, we have to bring it to the notion of success, helping more students actually finish credentials account, not just get in and actually access it. And our biggest problem right now is the hardcore truth about the income disparity of success rates in this, in this country. About, if you look at the, if you break it down by quartiles, the top two income quartiles in this country are between 65 and 85 percent likely to finish a post secondary credential journey. Bottom two income quartiles are collectively about 12 percent likely to finish. Big difference in terms of success rates. And one of our biggest challenges right now is figuring out how we can become radically more successful, especially with low income folks on these journeys, because most of the new good jobs being created require some kind of post-secondary credential, including things like being a welder. Okay? It, it doesn't matter. If you're going to be in any kind of CTE field, you're going to require some kind of industry certification that requires, if you look at the new NAM certifications for the National Association of Manufacturers, they require math and science and all kinds of, of, of core liberal arts skills. What we know is that post-secondary credential is a pathway to possibility, in particular if it is laddered and stacked into a credential pathway where someone can jump in and jump out. One of the biggest things of realizing is it is a huge benefit for a low-income person to get a pre-baccalaureate, sub-baccalaureate credential because you backstop them against the number one reason people are dropping out of higher ed journeys in this country. You realize there are 37 million people in this country that have significant, significant college coursework under their belt, post-secondary coursework, and no credential to show for it. In Texas alone, we have three and a half million people with that. And the number one reason they dropped out is because they were unable to complete the coursework successfully. Number one reason they dropped out was because life happened. Kids got sick, car broke down, money ran out, spouse moved, spouse ran out, whatever it is, but life happened along that journey. And this, one of the smartest things you can do is to backstop somebody with a sub-baccalaureate credential like an apprenticeship or a certification so that when life happens, they can get a living wage job and then get back into the higher ed market if they're gonna be with it. Are you with me on that? So part of our challenge is, is, is thinking about the work you're doing here with Columbus Schools is about launching students on pathways to possibilities and connecting them into completion pathways, in particular post-secondary completion pathways. And one of the things we're really clear on right now, folks, is that this is not a public school challenge. This is a community education challenge. It is a P20 challenge. The communities that have really taken it off, and you heard it in the last presentation, are the ones where, where multiple sectors come together. And in particular, you're seeing K-12 community colleges and universities working side by side with business and community action communities and the faith community and whoever else can play to create these pathways to possibility and develop it on. Good example of this. Metro Houston um, just produced this wonderful piece called A New Measure of Education Success in Texas. This was founded, this is funded by the Houston Endowment, but a bunch of other philanthropies jumped in. 
They actually tried to analyze what was happening in the P20 system, and one of the things they decided to do was to pick a number, something that would give them an aspiration to move towards, but they wanted to figure out what the data told them was their kind of success rate going forward. And so they said, let's look at a cohort of eighth graders and say, of these eighth graders, and track them, follow them all the way through for at least 11 years and find out what happened to them. So at least six years after they graduated from high school. And here's the question. How many of them had achieved a post-secondary credential with labor market value within six years after leaving high school? We agree, kind of a useful figure to figure out. And what they found out is if you begin with a cohort of 100 eighth graders and follow it all the way through, they, cared, they actually studied thousands and thousands and thousands of them. What they found out was basically about one in five eighth graders that you begin with would complete some kind of post-secondary credential with labor market value within six years after leaving high school. You think, well, that's already not great. One in five is the, are going to be on that pathway to possibility, but it's even worse. When you break it down by income and you break it down by, um, especially by ethnic factors, what they found out is if you are a young African-American male and you've, you've started with a hundred of them in the beginning, at the end of that journey, you would have eight of them would have received some kind of post-secondary credential labor market value. Hispanic, seven of them would have achieved it. Okay. And everybody sat back and said, and this is really important because this happens again and again and again in these P20 conversations. People look at the data and they don't believe it. They want to, they want to argue about the quality of the data. But let me tell you what, the data were pounded by NSHAMS, one of the most respected organizations out there. And people have to go through what I call the, the Kubler-Ross stages of death and dying with this, right? They look at the data and they have to go through denial and anger and bargaining and depression and acceptance. But then they finally get to the place and realize, boy, this is where we have to start from and we have to figure out how we can get radically better on this completion journey. And the folks in Houston and the folks in El Paso and the folks all over Texas and actually around the country you're seeing this are the, are the ones who are coming together around the data and saying, let's, let's pick a goal. Let's say that our goal is going to be we're not going to have a disparity between majority and minority students. We're going to make sure we're not going to have a disparity between high income and low income. We're going to get those achievement gaps out of the way. And we're going to try to get our numbers up in terms of total folks achieving some kind of post-secondary credential. But what I'm going to argue is that one of the conversations you need to have and get your arms around are what are your data saying about your flow of students through achieving some kind of post-secondary credential with labor market value. I would argue the goal of your system is not just to get somebody a high school degree. The goal of your system is to launch them on a pathway to possibility. Your local economic development demands it, and you've got to think about what that pathway through, through to a post, which, which means that, for example, the Columbus Community College folks have got, Columbus State's got to be here. They've got to be a part of the conversation and be in the larger uh, argument uh, as in terms of how that connection comes together. Now, what makes this difficult? is you, you are taking on that completion challenge in the middle of the largest um, transformation of our infrastructure we've seen in the world of education, um, which is not easy because you have multiple generations teaching and reaching and trying to connect with each other at the same time. And th this is just, it's just a fundamental challenge, if, and especially given that it's anchored in the use of technology. Just basic statistics from the Pew Internet Life Studies and what you find are things like, if you look at the generations, the traditional age generation, the boomers, the Xers, the Y, the Z, different experiences with our uses of technology. And what we can see is that X, Y, and Z generations are virtually always connected to some kind of internet device, and they're incredibly, they're ingenious about finding a device that can get them connected, even if they have to go to a McDonald's to be connected to some kind of wireless connection device. Um, they're comfortable with mobile devices, they're comfortable with texting. You know if you want to get a hold of a middle schooler or a high school, you're using some kind of a text device to get a hold of them. There's different capabilities, by the way, the Pew Research says the typical middle schooler and high schooler can text at 60 words a minute. The typical boomer can text at six words a minute, so there's just a <laughs> capability difference with that. But this is one of the big things for us to understand. We don't just have school buildings as an infrastructure anymore. The new infrastructure for learning is broader. The new infrastructure for learning includes the, uh, the notion of broadband and, and internet br more broadly and thinking about how do you work with your cable companies, how do you work with your phone companies and create that kind of infrastructure availability so that people in low income communities can get this. I've written two books on digital divide. I've well, looked at model programs from all over the country and what is very clear is that people who are aggressive about this can get things done and can get that kind of outreach and it's amazing how, what happens when you ask. 
in terms of the resources that can show up to build that kind of infrastructure. You've got mobile device ubiquity. There are now more mobile devices in the world than there are people in the world. You realize that, right? Okay. And in fact, um, one of the biggest trends they're seeing is that that figure will almost triple soon in terms of what you're, and again, what you're preparing your students for in terms of the world. You've got social network ubiquity. And by the way, social networking is not a kid's thing. Facebook's biggest problem is there are more grandparents on Facebook than there are grandkids. It's true. It's why they bought Instagram, because they're trying to figure out, because now LinkedIn is not a kid's network. Twitter is not a kid's network. So social networking is just part of how they're going to do business, and it's about of how, how they're going to learn. And if you want to just get an idea just mentally to kind of really grasp how different this is, Michael Wesh, who's a professor at Kansas State University, is an anthropologist, and he talks, he just helps people think about this difference in terms of how we're accessing information. Um, and it's the movement from fixed media information to hyperlinked to answer engines. Simple example. 20 years ago, someone brings you a question of fact you don't know the answer to. What do you have to do to answer the question? What do you have to do? Yeah. So you have a few. One, you could use a lifeline, call a friend, right? Or two, if you have a reference book and you're lucky, you can use that. Or three, you have to go to the library and at the library you have to use the card catalog and the card catalog is based on the Dewey Decimal System which tells you where in the library is the book with the stack with the chapter with the information you need and if you're really in hell you get microfiche right you all remember that by the way 16 year olds don't get that joke they don't because today if there's a question of fact that they don't know the answer to what do they do immediately they Google it. They have a totally different set of verbs. Remember, again, big, diverse, crazy family of mine. We had, a, we had this great night where 35 people were in the kitchen at one of our big family gatherings, and, my, and including Nana and others. And my niece came around the corner with the computer and announced to everybody that she had just Googled her boyfriend. And Nana about passed out. She's not married yet. No, it's not right. I'm like, calm down, Nana. <laughs> she, did, she didn't know what it meant. I don't know what she thought the computer was for, but <laughs> she was really upset about that whole thing. Um, but you compare the, the hyperlinked expectations that information is one link away is also different now from the rise of answer engines. And if you haven't seen things like Wolfram Alpha, WolframAlpha.com, I would encourage you to go to. Wolfram Alpha, you put in a, you put in a calculus problem, it will solve the problem, show you all the alternate forms and where it came from. It doesn't give you links to where you can do that, it does it for you. You put in the term life expectancy, and it will come up with a heat map of life expectancy from around the world, the top five countries, the lowest five countries. It'll give you demographic variables related to life expectancy, a rank curve and histogram of decline. And way at the very bottom of the page will be a link to sources. And you'll click on that and it'll show you 30, uh, the 30 top sources it went to in the one second it took to consolidate that information to pull all that up for you. Which is why in Europe I was at a conference recently where the number one conversation is open internet testing. How do you actually use assessments where students have to use the internet because that's how they're going to get their information and access it. What you want to know is where do they go, why do they go there, how do they synthesize it, why do they choose something as credible and not credible different kind of conversations. I spend some time on this because what we've got to begin thinking about is how and a continuing conversation. So first major conversation around the credential pathway, the second major conversation that is not going to be an easy one is going to be a continuing conversation about how you bring together the best of your traditional education with the new techniques and new technologies and it is not an either or. In fact, anybody who tells you it's an either or is out of their mind. What you've got to be thinking about is how these things come together. Because what you can tell is that if you do this the right way, you can begin to use all the arrows in your quiver to hit the learning mark. But you've got to think about the resources you have on the traditional side and the new technology side, and then figure out the learning goals you have for that. And the anchor in this is learning-centered design. You want the whole point of this design to figure out which of these tools and technologies and techniques is the best outcome for learning of that specific topic. There are some topics that can be done totally personally, they don't need any kind of technology, others that can easily leverage technology in a cost-effective kind of way. Some examples you can probably steal from are, I mean, the work of Carnegie Mellon in terms of tuning blended learning has been fantastic. I know you've had Tom Vanderark here talking about blended learning. 
One of my favorite things about the blended learning movement is people are finally moving away from the simplistic half online, half on ground. They're figuring out what do you do online and what do you do face to face. And my favorite line out of Carnegie Mellon's work on the open learning initiative is they use human learning science to tune the blend. And what they say is what you want to do is figure out how do you use technology to make your FaceTime precious. To make sure that the time with the individual teachers and the students is the best use of that relationship development time. And one of the, I was at a faculty focus group in this where a teacher said when they finally realized that the spray and pray lecture was the least valuable use of their time. What they want to be able to do is to develop. And so for the simple examples of the flip model, right, where you know, Sal Khan has the micro lectures and the homework is watching the lecture and the classroom is doing the math. Right? Those are the kind of things where you're thinking about how you tune that kind of work. Um, I, I use the example of Global Online Academy because Global Online Academy are your private school brethren who are beginning to sh now collectively do online learning and learn with each other um, how, to do how to actually share these resources. And one of the things you want to be able to do is figure out how this can also change the cost dynamic within your district, right? It's, it's saving time and saving cost. But my, one of my favorite lines out of GOA and also out of, of OLI, they talk about this, this notion of the technology dividend. The technology dividend is how do you use technology in a way where your extra time found is for that deep relationship, life-changing kind of work the teachers have always been able to do if they've been able to focus in some way. Now, as you do that, I want to challenge you because this change is more substantial than you think. Um, and and I, what I want to bring up is this notion of game-based learning and play-based learning because you might not have been pushed this far in this, but this is a notion around contextual-based learning and simulation-based learning. And one of the things I want to make sure we're clear on here is that contextual-based learning and simulation-based based learning are not new at all. They are thousands of years old. These are just new technologies to do the same thing great educators have always done, which is try to teach people in context what they can do. But the gaming industry is a way that can actually show us. Jane McGonigal, who's the author of a book called Reality's Broken that is worth reading, um, makes the claim that gamers might save the world. And, and part of her claim for that is the fact that many of these gamers have to work with international constituencies, hundreds of other people in collaboration, and they have to solve wicked problems, right? And she uses the example of a group of teenagers that were given the folded biology game and asked to solve an AIDS protein problem that researchers had spent 10 years on, and they solved it in three weeks, okay? Because of their ability to, again, go after that problem in a really significant way. But she makes the point, and this is important to think about, how many of you have a young person in your life that plays video games that you know? How much time and effort will they put in to go from one level of a game to another level of a game? Anybody who says the kids can't collaborate or cooperate or concentrate has never watched this kind of behavior, right? And they'll forego sleep and all kinds of other stuff to be able to get from one level to the next. But think about it. They have to demonstrate knowledge, skills, and ability at one level and have it assessed before they're allowed to go to the next level. What does that sound like? Kind of sounds like mastery-based learning, right? Or proficiency-based learning. There are things we can learn from this industry and realize, again, this is not a kid's thing. This is just quick data from the entertainment software industry that this is a more than a $25 billion industry because of the level of engagement that it has. Average age now of a gamer is 30, and the women are about to take over the gaming community just like they did the web. It took them a little while, but they're about to take over in the same way. Average age of a game purchaser is now 35, but the fastest growing cohort is the over 50 crowd. In particular, why do you think the senior citizen community is really taking off with gaming? Why do you think they're taking off with gaming? If you had to guess. They've got time, they've got money. And a uh, big one, cognitive researchers are now prescribing gaming because they say if you want to keep your neuroplasticity up, in other words, keep your brain fresh, you want to do something, this is one of my favorite lines, by the way, you want to be a rookie every year. You want to try something that stretches you out of your comfort zone because that rookie experience, it actually keeps your brain fresh and it's healthy for you. And there's nothing more rookie than having to sit down next to a 10-year-old teaching you a video game, right, in terms of what they do. But one of the big ones is, by the way, grandkids. And one of the funniest things I was writing, I'm, I'm in the process of writing a book and I'm interviewing a 75-year-old man who's playing EA Sports, NBA basketball, and an Xbox 360 with his two grandsons. His two grandsons are in different states at the time. They're playing over a headset on the internet against a, t a German team. And I don't mean a computer German team, a team of people who were in Germany. And the best part of the whole thing is when his grandsons got on Google and looked up German trash talking terms, 
<laughs> they're able to unnerve the other team and they were able to win, but on-demand learning, right, in terms of how they were going to make this work. What I'm going to challenge you on is what we know as you build, as you think about the target you're going to send people towards in a more of a blended infrastructure built on mobility and all the modern tools that we have, is you have to start thinking about how you take advantage of the deeper immersive learning environments. We know they work and there's lots of data around the fact that they work because of how the gaming industry engages. I would encourage you to read um, James Paul Gee, who's at Arizona State University, he has a couple of great books on this. This is a blog post from him. And by the way, I'm giving the PowerPoint presentation to the commission. It has links to everything I'm talking about. All the major presentation segments have links. Um, so you don't have to worry about taking notes. I'm always careful about PowerPoint because students have told me that many people who use PowerPoint have no power nor a point. So <laughs> I'm just always careful about it. But there are links out to all of this for you. And this is a link to a blog post from James Paul Gee all about 10 surprising truths about video games and learning. The bottom link is to um, uh, our friend Chris Deedy, who's a Timothy Wirth professor for learning at Harvard who is really big on this notion of augmented reality games to help students actually collaborate and solve wicked problems. And his biggest thing is, how do you collaborate with higher ed and, and secondary so that they can actually build some of these environments collectively and do some things where you engage kids at a higher level? Because what we know is that contextual learning works. And by the way, it doesn't have to be technology-enabled contextual-based learning. If you haven't seen iBEST, I would encourage you to look at the iBEST programs all around the country. iBEST stands for Integrated Basic Education and Skills Training. Integrated Basic Education and Skills Training. They teach academic subjects in technical training areas. While you're learning nursing, they teach you ESL. While you're learning auto mechanics, they actually teach you math. And what they have found with iBEST programs all around the country, in fact, the data were so good we didn't believe it when we were at the Gates Foundation, is that you see anywhere from five to nine times higher graduation rates when people learn in context, right? It just makes sense. When you learn math in context, when you learn writing in context, you learn it in a deeper way. And it's so, so it doesn't necessarily have to be tech enabled, but the notion of simulation and contextual based experiences really matter. And as you plan out your next generation infrastructure, you can't leave it behind and think it's just gonna be the same lecture and multiple choice kind of environment. You've got to figure out how you can make it more engaging and kind of richer for those students as they're doing it. All that is empowered by fourth major conversation, which is a radical transformation in learning resources. You realize right now the world of education is living through a, an absolute tsunami of change when it comes to learning resources. We are in the same spot the music industry was in seven or eight years ago when Napster was fundamentally flipping the entire business model upside down. Um, anybody upset about textbook costs at all for the students out there? Yeah, it's a big deal. And so what I can tell you from the world of higher ed, it's probably about five years ahead of you, is that um, they, by going digital and moving towards bring your own device, have reduced textbook costs by almost 50%. And one of the things they've done is they've really pounded the publishers to make it digital and to make it modular. That's happening side by side as the, the rise of the open content movement, where now you've got freely available open content that's available because teachers, I did a big study on Teaching Excellence Award winners back in the late 90s, early aughts, that resulted in a book called Practical Magic. And the, one of the results of that study, of studying 2,000 Teaching Excellence Award winners, was the finding that teachers are, are great teachers are the purveyors of the case method. Case stands for copy and steal everything, right? Really good teachers steal from other really good teachers. The open content movement is a giant case method that's happening right now. If you go to OER Commons, for example, which stands for Open Education Resource Commons, you will find 200 countries, tens of thousands of teachers sharing curricular resources on every topic you can imagine all freely available, all accessible for students and for teachers themselves. If you go to Hippo Campus, you now have research-tested curricular resources on every major concept that's tripping students up. You go to the Rice Connections Project, they have the same thing. And now you've got resources like Big Think and even the YouTube EDU channels where now we have, our students have more open and free content than ever before. Our biggest challenge is curating that and pulling it all together. So here's the big thing is I actually think every school district in the country should eliminate its textbook committees. It should no longer have textbook committees. It should have learning resource strategy leadership. And learning resource strategy is basically these three things. 
You figure out what are the learning objectives for that course or for that learning area, whatever it might be, figure out those learning competencies. Then you have a group that goes and curates the best digital curricular resources possible that would help a student learn those things, and then go find the assessments that will tell you a student can do those, can actually, has mastered those learning competencies. Our biggest problem right now is we typically work backwards on all those. We adopt a textbook to decide what the learning outcomes are and use the assessments that are given to us by the textbook. Okay? Going forward, we're going to have to figure out this strategy, the curation strategy in particular, and let me tell you the big three. For the curation of those learning resources, you have to have people who are willing to do what's called the build by share. The build by share is what curricular resources are you going to build because you have that really good stuff and experienced teachers to build it. What are you going to buy from the publishers and what are you going to share on the open content kind of freely available space market. And by the way, start getting innovative with the cost model. Let me give you something you could think about stealing from Western Governors University. What we found is our low income learners were the least likely to use the curricular resources at the highest level. Part of the reason is because they couldn't access it really well. So we actually worked hard on the BYOD to make sure they had devices so they could access the resources and they could print it when they wanted to. But the second thing we did is we actually went to the publishers and said, if you don't want us to use open content as much as you think we might be using it, um, why don't you give us some kind of incentive to use more of the publisher content, which and here was our big thing. We said, how about we only pay you for the content when the student passes the assessment against which they're studying your content? And they did what you just did. <laughs> we said that. And we started conversations with McGraw-Hill, with Pearson, with Cengage, with Wiley, all about this concept. And, and I can tell you right now, we have now contracts with all of them, especially with McGraw-Hill, on this concept. And the, the reason we love it is because it's a structural incentive for the textbook folks to fix bad content. Because right now, the only incentive they have is to turn out a new, ver new version of the book. Right now, they actually are trying to fix the exact sections that are causing the biggest problems. And it also saved us a ton of money. And I can tell you, cost modeling wise, this is one of the biggest areas you can save dollars for your district, is to really look at the curricular resource side of this. Let me tell you what, learning resource strategy is one of the gold mines you can go after to actually try to harvest resources back into your district and think about how you're going to pull those resources back to do more innovative kinds of things. Also realize you're going to have students who are going to be edupunks. If you haven't read the book DIYU, it's one of those really challenging, interesting reads. DIYU stands for Do-It-Yourself University. Um, and it's the notion that now our kids are end running us and they're finding the learning resources on their own. If they don't get it from their teacher, they actually go try to find it on their own. And part of what we need to think about is how do we enable those learners to actually um, have access to good resources in the, in the long run. And I'll talk a bit about that infrastructure as we go in together. This has to come together anchored in analytics and data, which means we have to have our arms around the data that tells us whether students are succeeding or whether they're not. This article from Phil Long and George Siemens is one of the best on the notion of learning analytics, and it makes, helps people understand the difference between administrative analytics and learning analytics. And I'm going to ask you that one of the biggest things you're going to have to do is to change your orientation to data and adopt a, a, a kind of a yin and yang balanced approach to data that might be a little bit different for you. Most, I'm going to be blunt about this, most data initiatives in education are ridiculously too slow and they're off target. They're sending data to school boards, administrators, legislators, as opposed to sending data to the front lines. If you look at the consumer world and the healthcare world, when data transformed those industries, and they have transformed those industries top to bottom, business model top, uh, top to bottom, it changes fundamentally when you actually get data to the front lines. You get data to students and you get data to teachers and you let them begin to tune what's happening. Simplest example is if you look at what, you know, I love what the folks at Purdue did with the learning management system, where they just said, let's look at the data coming out of our learning management system and find out what's, as, what resources students are accessing and how they're scoring on the tests and how they're behaving. And they, um, the John Campbell, who was the chief scientist behind this, started analyzing it. And they said, this is great. We can look at these data and reform the courses. He said, no, I'm going to give it to the students. He said, what are you going to give them? Spreadsheets and crosstabs and dashboards? No, no. Every time a student logs in, they're going to get a traffic light. And the traffic light's going to say one of three things. Students like you who've done the kind of things you're doing right now succeeded. Green light. Keep doing whatever you're doing. Based on our data, students like you doing the kind of things you're doing didn't do so hot. Yellow light. You might want to think about X, Y, or Z. 
Students like you did the kind of things you're doing right now, failed miserably, stop now, flashing red light, talk to somebody. But it doesn't wait for the midterm, it's every time the student logs in. And what this does is allow the student to self-regulate and allows the faculty member to regulate so the idea they can tune their learning journey. Does that make sense? Yeah. But it's a different way of approaching data. And if you think about this, when, you know, that GPS system I put that address into does not send me a big interactive map that I can pull out and start spreading a lot. What does it tell me? It says turn left, turn right, right? And it tells me turn around, you made the wrong turn, right? And that's the kind of data system we've got to start thinking about with our own students and how we interact with it. Think about the Ford Fusion. The Ford Fusion folks, when they had problems because their drivers were not getting the gas mileage they were supposed to get out of their cars, and they analyzed it, and they figured out it's because of driver error, how does it go over when you tell the customer it's their fault? Not really well. So they decided, they were brought in a company called IDEO, and they said, let's figure out how we bring the data to the driver in a way that will help them change their behavior, help them go in a different direction. And they created this wonderful little plant. That plant's not a decoration. That plant in the right-hand side is an interactivity. And if you drive the car the right way, the leaves begin to come out, the flowers bloom, and the plant thrives. If you drive the car the wrong way, the leaves begin to wither, the flowers go down. If you lend your car to your son and you get it back and the plant's dead, you know what happened with the car, right? But it solved the problem because they were allowed to interact with it. Simple things like, this is a Civitas dashboard of learning engagement. It harvests all the data on ground and online and says, based on the data, here is our level of engagement for the folks that are in your class right now. And for a teacher to be able to see that the last time we did a lecture, the last assignment we had, the engagement went up or engagement went down, don't you think that'd be useful for your, your kids? The biggest thing for us now is to make sure the data initiatives that you're thinking about are data initiatives that will actually get data to the front lines as well as this accountability data. Because if you don't get data to the front lines, the accountability data is going to look the same and look the same and look the same no matter how clean it is. So in the K-12 space, probably most aggressive initiative on this is this InBloom initiative that's being led by the Gates Foundation and a host of others, and I would encourage you to plug into it because the InBloom is specifically looking for districts that don't have the resources to do this themselves and helping them harvest data to lean towards personalized learning. The idea is how can you develop these tools that get these simple dashboards to kids and to teachers so they can tune the learning on this side. Again, most data initiatives are focused way too much on getting data to school boards and legislators, and by then it is way too late. By the time you have coalesced and analyzed and staged data about the students in your district, what has happened to the students in your district? They're gone. Okay, think about it. how many of you shop at Amazon? What happens at Amazon while you're buying a book? People like you who bought this also bought this, this, and this, right? And I can tell you with great clarity, that's a huge math run. They have to do a big data mining project and a predictive model just about you. And how long does it take them? Like two weeks or three weeks to get you the data? How long does it take? It takes under a second. It only takes longer because of your bandwidth, right? And do they give you spreadsheets and crosstabs? No. They say, here are the three books you should think about. And after a while, it's kind of creepy <laughs> how much they know, right, in terms of what you're going to like. You're actually looking for it. This is the idea of where we should be thinking about with our students. Think about this. Think about this. We should not think this is too crazy because it's not. Students like you have had this problem in math have found this learning object to be useful. Wouldn't that be great? So that any student from any background can have access to a learning resource on the spot to help them learn, especially if they want to be a hardy learner and drive their own learning. They don't have anybody in their background that can help them learn. This is something that can help give them some kind of an access point where they can pull that together. But you've got to get serious about the data side of it. Final two conversations. Around, one is around this notion of non-cog convergence, which relates to this data piece. There is now more, um, especially in the higher ed side, believe it or not, one of the things they've found on the higher ed side, if you've read a book called Crossing the Finish Line, they have now discovered that the college placement exams are pretty bad, actually, predicting whether or not students will be successful in higher ed. And a better predictor of whether or not somebody will complete in higher ed is actually the high school GPA. And you know why the high school GPA is? It doesn't matter whatever high school they come from. It's because that student knows how to work a system. Right? 
and it has to do with being able to manage a system and manage a bureaucracy, right? And that has to do with the non-cognitive factors. And the folks like Carol Dweck, Angela Duckworth, and a host of others, and these are a couple of great books that would help you kind of jump into this notion, but especially the notions of purpose, helping a student get to the idea of purpose. Why are they on an education pathway and what is the goal? What are they shooting towards? But any kind of thing, any kind of work you can do to get to a student, get a student to purpose. If they understand purpose, if they understand the why, they can almost overcome any how. There's great research behind that. To help them understand this is not edutainment, this is an education. And education is an engaging process that so they have to engage and they're going to have to work. And that's that notion of a growth mindset. You do not reward talent, you reward work. It's, and, and the whole idea, let me tell you what, even in higher ed, we get this all the time. Students who've been told they're beautiful, wonderful, special, talented, and if they get data, that if they get any kind of feedback from a teacher that tells them they're not beautiful, wonderful, and talented, what do they think? Something's wrong with the teacher, right? I got a call from a 65-year-old woman two weeks ago arguing about a grade that her 45-year-old son got in our university. I mean, talking about a major helicopter grandma coming after us, right, in this whole thing. What amazes me about this is, again, this, uh, this notion of, of people assuming that because somebody's wonderful, beautiful, talented, they should be able to be successful. What the growth mindset work says, no, you, what you do is you say, if you got a good grade, you must have worked hard, right? And if you didn't, here are some strategies to help you work more effectively. You reward work, and you, you make sure that people kind of develop that growth mindset. By the way, really hard to self-navigate and have a growth mindset if you don't have data. If you don't know when you're on to off target and on target. And I would argue most students are basically trying to manage with data that is the equivalent of this. They're trying to regulate the heat in their house with a farmer's almanac. It's true. What they need is a thermostat that tells them when it's too hot and when it's too cold, right? And they're able to navigate that journey more effectively. And we're not getting them the data. They need more of those data if they're going to be driving it forward. What we know from the data on non-cognitive research is that it is a combination of purpose, engagement, and tenacity. And let me tell you what, the tenacity and grit research is powerful. It basically says that ability to be tough and overcome challenges matters. But let me tell you what, tenacity and persistence without strategy is insanity. The student just bang bangs their head against the same wall. So you've got to help them develop the kind of strategy necessary. And there's really good research out there around non-cog pieces of this. Where this really matters, folks, and I was at Michigan State University a few weeks ago, and we were talking about this notion. They were talking about the reality of 6-1 kids versus 1-1 kids. 6-1 kids are kids from their higher-end backgrounds who come from backgrounds from third, fourth, and fifth generation higher education kids. Okay? I was a first generation kid. I had no understanding of what I was doing in higher ed. I didn't know what an AA stood for, or what an AS was, or what a BA was. I kind of knew what BS was, right? was figuring it out. But every single one of my kids had a UT Austin onesie on in the crib. Right? Full expectations of where they were going to be going. A 6-1 kid is a kid that has two parents and four grandparents all focused on them graduating from higher education and getting through that side. Where they were talking about Michigan State, the difference between that and a kid who's a 1-1 kid, who at most has one person in their life who cares about them succeeding in higher ed, and many of them are 0-1 kids that you've got to think about the scaffold differently and about how you actually help them develop that toughness to be able to manage that journey because they're not going to have the same kind of scaffold as they're going through post-secondary. It really matters. Final idea. Um, one of the things we have to help our students realize is that as they take more personal responsibility for their own learning, because this is a big deal. This is about them showing up with us doing our work. And as they show up, one of the things we have to challenge them and we have to make it able for them is that they are curators of credentials. I talked about this earlier. The, the communities that are doing this best are connecting their public schools, their community colleges, and their universities on these pathways. And they're figuring out these stacked credentials and helping students realize the idea of curating credentials. The Grand Canyon experiment in Arizona, one of the, and I put that link up there, is one of the things they're saying is high school, instead of thinking about high schools as getting students through a high school degree, Think about high school as a point in time. That you're taking 14 to 18 year olds and you're helping them achieve as many credentials as possible between 14 and 18. There are now 120 early college high schools in the state of Texas. And the biggest, most successful early college high schools are the ones in communities like South Texas and El Paso. 
that are fully stocked with students who come from low-income backgrounds who would have probably most often dropped out of their local high schools. I was at the El Paso Community College graduation where 400 of those kids from one of the first early college high schools were getting their associate's degree before they got their high school diploma. Okay? And these are kids that everybody had given up on. Okay? And what we know is that they will rise to the right expectations if you build the kind of connections for them to be able to pull that together. But it's not just about the credential, it's also about the higher learning capabilities. You are, that notion of critical learning and creative learning and social learning and courageous learning still radically matters and I don't want to walk away from that. And one of the things we've got to think about is how we actually challenge the students to step up and develop these kind of core learning skills because it's not just about trades, right? It's about their ability to learn how to learn for a lifetime. We're preparing them for jobs that don't exist yet very often, right? And, and, and one of the things we've got to think about, by the way, is social learning radically matters in this context. How do most kids get their first jobs after they get done with their education? How do they get their first jobs? Is it because of their credential they get their job? It's a social network. Why are most people fired from their jobs? Take out economic downturn. Why are most people fired? Is it because of technical incompetence? No, the SHRM folks, Society for Human Resource Managers, have a joke for it. They call it the jerk effect. Either you're fired because you are a jerk or you're fired by a jerk. But there's always a jerk involved in the situation somewhat. The idea that the social side of this really matters for these students, which is why the human side of the education enterprise can't be, can't be underestimated. And then the notion of courageous learning, the ability to have these students develop the ability to learn for a lifetime. I love this quote from Eric Hoffer. He says, in times of drastic change, it is the learners who inherit the future. The learned usually find themselves equipped to live in a world that no longer exists. It's the idea that you are training your students to be lifelong learners if they're going to move through this process. So these are not easy conversations. There are a lot of these conversations. And one of the things I want to point out, last couple of ideas before we'll open it up for any questions you might have, is that this is not going to be something where you're going to go adopt these strategies and be done. These catalytic conversations are going to take time and have to unfold as you develop a crawl, walk, run strategy for your own community. And what I'm going to encourage you is as you have these conversations, buckle up because as you have these conversations, two groups tend to dominate them. One group I call the caustic cynics. Caustic cynics are angry about everything. It doesn't matter what you talk about. You bring manna from heaven, it's too salty for them and they're mad, right? A friend of mine calls them cave people, colleagues against virtually everything, right? How many of you can think of a cave person somewhere in your world that you know? Well, yeah, and if you can't think of the person, you might be. The, <laughs> point that out. They're only equaled, and they are equaled by the true believers. The true believers overpromise and underdeliver and cut the credibility out of their initiatives. Whatever they're into, everybody's supposed to be into. If everything's not online learning, you're, you're Satan, right? And our problem is many of these conversations, these kinds of conversations in particular, get hijacked. They get hijacked by the loud voices who tend to be bullies and they tend to take over the dialogue. And the only way a substantive, um, high-powered conversation can take place is if you're willing to calm down the caustic cynics and temper the true believers and create a space where you can look at the data around this and determine what makes sense for you. Because it's going to be determined what makes sense for you, what the first initial steps are going to look like. But let me tell you what, the journey is not going to look like the journey you used to take. It's going to look like a whole new journey for these, these kids. And you've got to think about how that, journey, that differentiated journey is going to look different for them and how you can actually build something substantive and unique and special for them if they're going to be able to move forward. Okay. I've got a final idea, but I'll open it up for any questions you might have before we jump out. We have questions. Show of hands. One of the things that struck me um, while you were talking is how are we preparing teachers yeah. to be ready to, to teach in this environment? And as I was thinking about the question, I thought about in the young people who are in college are people who get this stuff. Um, but how are our institutions of higher education and the education departments yeah. uh, actually adjusting how they're teaching kids to prepare to be teachers in this environment. Yeah. I think colleges of education are in, um, they're in a, an absolute flux right now because they're dealing with this kind of change all around them. And, and there, there really is a challenge because many times they're turning out students who are thinking in cutting edge ways and they go into districts and they get normed. 
you know, pretty quickly, which is pretty painful, which is why you see a two, like a less than two year turnover rate for a lot of new teachers who are coming out. So I think one of the things that has to happen probably in the course of the next decade is this kind of tuning between a more progressive districts and more um, progressive colleges of education who can work in collaboration. A good example is at University of Georgia, their College of Ed has been working closely with school districts all around the state and they're trying to find those school districts that are really trying to, to think about what a next generation learning infrastructure would look like and they're trying to make sure they place their, you know, their more you know, cutting edge students with those kinds of districts because the worst thing you can do is place a, you know, a really innovative, cutting edge kind of new teacher into an environment where they just get slammed down by an existing culture. Uh, and the worst thing you could do is to get somebody who is a brand new teacher who just has learned how to do everything the old way, right? So I think what you have to do is figure out how we can get that tuning happening. Okay, Mary Jo. Oh, thank you. It, um, I, it, it's interesting, um, well, we've heard here that there are areas of, of our city that are um, that, that really have challenges in terms of connectivity at all. Yeah. And so for, for students outside of school, they don't they can't find a place for the internet. And mm -hmm. um, and that that's not unique to just the city. I mean that's Absolutely. outside. But but um, do you have any quick examples of some districts that um, that may have tried to address that issue creatively as a community. Yeah, so uh, a good example for, is uh, in, in Ohio, right here at, at Sinclair Community College, working with their surrounding school districts. They actually looked at their library and realized uh, they had a gorgeous library. I don't know if you've probably been to the library at Sinclair College. I mean, absolutely gorgeous. It was pristine. The furniture was, was just untouched, and that's the problem. The furniture was untouched, right? Nobody was going in the library. And they actually were averaging about 400 people a day using a library for a center city community college of 26,000 students. And so they said, we've got to change the dynamic here. And so one of the things they did is they started thinking about how they could actually open up that library to be a resource for the local schools and for their own community college in a more broad way. They started looking at library projects all around the country. And one of the things they decided to do was to put a Starbucks in the middle of their library meeting tables and couches around that, plexiglass meeting rooms for teachers and for students around that, and to open it up to partnerships with their local um, high schools, and especially with the, some of their local early college high schools. Um, and they had to sedate the librarian, but that was okay, they got over that, past that. Actually, she became one of the absolute champions of this because they ended up having to almost triple their staff because now they average more than 4,000 people a day using their library. They have had to kick people out at night, they have people standing in line when they first walk in the door, and, and the, their favorite thing is over a quarter of the people who are in that library are there on days that they don't have class. So it's become this oasis for them away from schools. And so high schoolers that are taking dual enrollment classes and others. And you're seeing that with public library initiatives around the country, where public libraries are saying they want to be the oasis hotspot and they want to become this education hub. And, and by the way, that's not just in this country. You're seeing that the f colleges of further education in the UK are doing the exact same thing. And even folks who are a part of the African Virtual University, that has been the big hub strategy, hub and spoke strategy for the African Virtual University is to create these digital learning centers. Because the realization that, that we do students no favor by dumbing down the, the learning architecture for them because when they leave your caring arms, they're going to go to a community college or university that requires that technology use. So whatever you can do to try to provide that infrastructure, the better off it is. So the biggest strategies that I've seen that work well are work with community college, work with libraries, and then work directly with the cable companies and with the phone companies and asking pretty you know, heartily for the, the ability to actually have them turn on the pipe for students who are going to be able to leverage it in some ways, and then going to the hardware providers and other, other places to try to get the different devices for the learners to be able to use it. But I, do, I would just say do not give up on that one. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Milliron. Okay. Let's have an applause. Yeah. So it's going to be, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Mark, it's, uh, you understand why we want to have you have, have a chance to have a conversation with Mark. Um, so it's my uh, privilege to, uh, come on up folks. Uh, I, I introduce to you the last panel of the uh, information gathering stage of our Columbus Education Commission. I know we've listened to a lot um, but actually, uh, and we're going to, uh, with apologies uh, to our presenters, you know how much time people prepare their presentations uh, for us. 
And uh, of course, we're, we're now down to just a, a few moments, so I apologize to them for all the information they've prepared for us that they won't have a chance to share. Uh, but the, um, uh, Mark really teed up this last conversation. Several times today, we've had uh, the reference to uh, if we're going to be successful, we all have to be in, right? Stacking hands, and how, do we, how are we in as a community? And how do we sustain over time? And Mark, uh, you know, uh, not even realizing what was coming next, gave us a couple examples. He just uh, answered uh, Mary Jo by talking about reaching out to the cable companies and reaching out to the hardware providers and, and reaching out to the community colleges and making sure that the libraries are open and all of those kinds of things that, um, that are critical. And so we've known from the beginning that this conversation wasn't, uh, we've been explicit, this conversation isn't just about what the schools can do, this isn't just about what others can do, this is about what we all can do. Um, and so we thought it appropriate to end this last meeting where we're still uh, gathering information uh, by asking that very question. Uh, what, can, uh, uh, what can we all do? And in particular, what can the private sector do uh, to be, um, to be a, a contributor to the success of education uh, in, uh, in Columbus. Uh, we have three folks up here, and uh, we're going to go uh, from my immediate left um, uh, first. So uh, sitting next to me is Steve Campbell. Uh, many of you know Steve. Uh, he's the director of uh, the mayor of Mayor Coleman's uh, Office of Policy. Um, and uh, he has been taking a look uh, at uh, what some of what uh, private sector initiatives are doing in other cities, in other communities, because the mayor has a deep and abiding interest um, in, uh, in making sure that Columbus is the best in the nation um, at uh, coordinating educational initiatives with its private sector. And so Steve is going to say, uh, give us a little bit of, of what that overview looks like. Uh, following that, uh, Janet Jackson, of course, is a member of our commission and the president and CEO of our United Way uh, of uh, Central Ohio. Uh, she's already mentioned today the extent of, of the uh, community support for education. But we've also asked her to, putting on her United Way hat, which is, of course, an international organization, to give us a, a, also a sense of what some of the best practice is uh, in, this, um, uh, in this field as our local eye into the United Way uh, world. Um, and then finally, uh, Anthony Smith, who is the principal of Taft High uh, in Cincinnati. And I'm going to let, uh, I'm gonna let uh, uh, Principal Smith share with you a little bit more about Taft High because it's an extraordinary story. But I do want the commission to know uh, that Cincinnati public schools are among what we call the big eight, uh, the eight largest urban districts in the state. They are the highest performing of the, uh, of the big eight. Um, and, uh, and they have had deep and long-lasting partnerships with the private sector, and in particular Taft High has with Cincinnati Bell. And so Principal Smith is going to share with us um, some, uh, uh, some of that information. Uh, I only will add one more word. Uh, I'm, I'm, we'll all, we, we have Steve and, and Janet both in our community, so they'll pardon me for not giving their long bios uh, uh, for them. Uh, but I do, uh, since uh, Principal Smith is a guest in our, uh, in our community and came up here especially to speak to the commission, I do want you to know that he's been an administrator with Cincinnati Public Schools for over 20 years um, and the principal of the Robert A. Taft Information Technology High School uh, for 10 years until he was promoted to assistant superintendent. Um, he has uh, received numerous honors. He's a principal coach for Cincinnati Public Schools. We heard Steve Dacken talk about uh, coaching uh, principals. Um, he was honored as the recipient of the John Jacobs Administrator of the Year Award, uh, was recognized, Janet, you recognize this as champion for children by the 4C Foundation. He was named a man of honor by the Abercrombie Group as part of its Men of Honor, a salute to African-American men program in November 2011. So he's a distinguished leader and we're fortunate to have him with us today. So we're gonna begin with uh, Steve um, and then Janet um, and then uh, Principal Smith. Thank you, Chancellor. First of all, on behalf of the mayor, I want to thank all of you for your service on this commission today. I think the morning and afternoon presentations demonstrated uh, that we are grappling with some of the most important issues and challenges this community faces, and uh, it's important that we stick with this. Uh, we remain all in, and as the mayor likes to say, that we stack hands on this issue. 
in your packets we provided information about what other communities are doing and in particular what the business community is doing to help support education initiatives and we won't go city by city uh, in this presentation in the interest of time but I think it's important to point to um, we're dealing with very important issues here but these are issues that communities all over the country are dealing with this is the toughest issue in uh, big cities is, is how we make sure that our children get the quality education they, they deserve. These problems are not unique to Columbus. What the material also shows is that communities are working very hard to, to, to develop capacity to deal with these issues. And what do I mean by that? We need to make sure that we can find a place in our community that will serve as the advocate, that will serve as the researcher, that will serve as the uh, accountability clerk uh, for our initiatives, and most importantly, to help raise money and help marshal those funds to go towards the important initiatives. We need a, a point of collaboration in this city, much like uh, many cities across the country have, have founded. I think a good place to start is really to take a look at some of the things that the mayor has said about education and also the charge of this commission. In the mayor's state of the city, he made a very simple point at the beginning of his talk with education. Every child deserves to go to a good school. And although that's a clear point, I think we've realized that that's a very hard point for all of us to get with. So how are communities around the country developing the capacity to get to that goal? How do they attract and replicate and expand good schools district schools and public charter schools through financial and administrative support. What, what the research shows is that when communities set that goal, the business community and, and churches and other uh, foundations locally align their money to it. In Philadelphia, as, as your material will show, they're raising $100 million for this very purpose not to go to public schools, not to go to charter schools, but to go to the best schools. In Indianapolis, they created the Mind Trust. Again, an innovator in education to set standards, recruit good schools, and raise money to help attract them. In Chicago, they've raised millions of dollars to go towards this effort, but also have focused on partnerships between the foundations, the business community, and social organizations and community schools um, to partner about 150 schools with over 400 companies and, and organizations to help support a good community school network. The mayor also laid out in the state of the city we need to attract the best teachers and principals in the country. Again, a very important goal, and how do we retain those principals and teachers? Again, Chicago is an example. They've raised over $100 million for public education uh, efforts uh, to support the schools, uh, but they've dedicated a significant part of that, $10 million, uh, to um, incent providing incentives to teachers and principals and providing training to them so that they've got the best quality teachers they can bring to their community. The mayor also laid out goals on um, pre-kindergarten education, technology in schools, um, and, career, and career preparation. And every one of these communities um, have initiatives involved that align the private sector, raise millions of dollars uh, to help support these initiatives. In Boston, they've created a, a program that's raised $32 million for after school that focuses on having a child in productive educational and employment settings after school so that they continue their education after the school bell rings. The most important thing all these lessons point to is that we need to develop in our community one place, that place of capacity in our community so that we can go to it, allow it to be our advocate, allow it to hold ourselves accountable, the business sector, the schools, and the city and have a place where parents, educators, and our civic and business leadership can come together. That's kind of a quick overview, and I'd like to turn it to the rest of the panel. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Janet? 
Thank you. So I'm going to start by apologizing to my wonderful staff for all the great work they did to get me ready for this because I'm about to throw it out. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to try to make this as, as succinct uh, as I can. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about United Way Worldwide. So let me remind many of you in the audience of who my predecessor was, Brian Gallagher. And when Brian was here at this local United Way, folks like Tanny Crane and probably Rhonda Johnson saw the work of United Way really begin to change. Quite frankly, for decades, we were mostly uh, an entity that raised money. We were almost a pass-through organization to other nonprofits. You saw Brian begin to narrow the work here uh, in Columbus in seven different areas. So he left us, went to what was then United Way of America, now United Way Worldwide, and he took that same uh, thought process uh, to the national system. And let me just share with you a little, bit, a little bit of our numbers in terms of how large we are as an organization. Um, we raised about $10 million uh, a year with over 500,000 folks in the workplaces. We also have about 2.5 uh, million volunteers. In terms of the number of United Ways, there are over 1,200 United Ways. So we are an extremely large network. And actually, uh, we raise about $4 billion a year uh, world, worldwide. In 2008, for really the first time, Brian said to the system, again, we need to focus. And our work on a national level is in three areas, education, income, and health. And we have really focused on the national level in education. Uh, not every community, but most of your large United Ways, your, your major United Ways, we've worked together. We've come together to learn how to do this, how to turn outward. We were one of the nine United Ways in the first mobilization plan. We're really serious about how do we in our own communities convene individuals around the issues uh, of education. Uh, the national goal uh, that was started in 2008 was to cut the dropout rate in half by uh, 2018. One of the things that I am so grateful for Brian doing at the national level is creating major, major, major partnerships. So whether it's with Diplomas uh, Now, America's Promise, uh, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and I get a call from Tom Ryland from our own WOSU. Tom is in Washington, D.C. with the 25 largest public radio stations meeting with uh, the president of United Way of America, Stacey Stewart, and trying to figure out how local United Ways and local public broadcasting stations can work together on these educational issues. Uh, we focus our work uh, at United Way of America in these areas. Enter, uh, children enter school ready to succeed. <clears throat> they read proficiently by fourth grade. They make a successful transition to middle school. They graduate from high school on time and they be ready for success in college, work, and life. Doesn't that sound familiar in terms of what we're talking about uh, now? So I will tell you uh, that our work locally really came a little bit before UWWs, but it's very, very, very similar. We have focused on turning outward getting out of that building at 360 uh, South 3rd Street to really engage the community. And as I look around this table, there are so many partners. Everything we've done for the 10 years that I've been here and even before, education folks were at the table with us. So whether they were members of the board like Rhonda and Dr. Harris, or whether they sit on the various committees, we've been there. So from our perspective, it's our role to partner with as many community entities. These can't, you know, our goals are not United Way's goals. They absolutely must be community goals. So we have been, one of my best partners is Pat Lasinski from the library and whatever it is that we do. So, I mean, there are lots of words here that I could talk about in terms of what it is we do, but I think I would just share with you that a primary goal for us locally is that every child in this community succeeds. And however and whenever, we can work collaboratively with entities to ensure that. And that includes raising the resources that we need to put into initiatives that we think will really work like Columbus Kids. So again, I could talk for another 20 minutes. It is late in the day. We are ready to wrap this bad boy up, and I know that. But I'm always here, and again, there are so many individuals around this table. I didn't mention some of my other board members, Marie Jo Hudson. 
uh, Jordan Miller, Kathleen Murphy, I can just tell you that collectively United Way is so committed to this work. And we are learning new and different ways to get us there. We are not afraid of change. If you know me, you know that I am one of the biggest risk takers that you are ever going to meet. And so, and I have hopefully led my United Way to, to take that on. So we are, I'll simply say we are here to be a part of whatever it takes to make sure that all of our children are successful. Thank you, Janet. Would you, we'll take the microphone to Principal Smith. And uh, again, uh, Principal Smith, I apologize for the short amount of time, but the, uh, the, 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 our understanding of the partnership that you had with the private sector that helped rebuild Taft High School um, is a model uh, that we've heard lots about, and we'd love to understand from you how that came about and, and what the key elements of that are. Thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me. David, are you still here? Thank you. Um, when you first introduced me and called me Principal Smith, I was happy because now I'm the assistant superintendent, so <laughs> that's a struggle most days. But the partnership at Cincinnati Bell uh, was unique in its own way, uh, simply because there was a gentleman who decided he wanted to make sure that he would hire the students to be future employees and he would also want them to become future customers. It was a very self-serving uh, idea on his, on his part. Uh, it wasn't just an educational reform movement. It was an idea that says, here's a community of young people who will not ever have a chance to work for my company. And if there are companies out there uh, in the audience today, and I'm sure there, there are, you, you have to figure out what is it that you can provide to help young people get prepared for the 21st century? I think young people are ready. I think we uh, hold them back sometimes based on our ignorance because we believe we know more, and in many cases we don't. We think we do. Uh, we tamper with education because we can, but you would never tamper with a physician's blade because that would be dangerous. So we have to make sure that we really understand what the reform movement is really all about. I had the pleasure of starting a uh, middle school, and the middle school was for overage students who had failed before. And one of the things that we figured out, we had to do an accelerated project. And the accelerated project out of Stanford University was really geared to helping students figure out what their weaknesses were, but we were also working on their strengths. Too many times our educational movement, we concentrate on the strengths when we get ready to, but we always focus on the weaknesses. And we stay with the weakest part of this child's uh, content. Uh, I think the other thing that we need to really focus on as it becomes apparent about our educational movement, what is it that we really want our children to be ready to do when they hit the college doors? What do we really want them to know when they leave our high schools? Uh, I, we, we have a lot of rhetoric about what we think it should be, and I'm listening to your conversation about all in. Uh, it's very cliche. However, uh, some people want to be counted in but not counted on, and that's where the struggles come in. Uh, all of these children are our responsibility, and so at TAF, we, we, I, I heard you say earlier where students had individual academic plans. Well, they had individual academic plans. Each student, all 725 of them, had an individual plan tailored just for them. And the plan was very specific based on their strengths and based on their weaknesses. And here was a company who came in, Cincinnati Bell, and the CEO, Jack Cassidy, and his idea was, how do we make this endeavor worthwhile for not just the student but for the entire community? So the day that I took the job, the graduation rate was 12%. I didn't know it until I had already signed the contract. But 10 years later, uh, the graduation rate is 97%. And the students are very, very interested in, how, in, in figuring out how do we become better learners and better readers and better understanding, uh, better motivators about our content and knowledge. One of the things that was very interesting my last year, uh, we had been rated excellent by the Ohio Department of Education two years in a row. Uh, we received the National Blue Ribbon. Uh, our basketball team won the state championship, and we were featured on uh, ABC World News Tonight with uh, Diane Sawyer. 
So I figured with all of those accolades, it was time for me to get out <laughs> because trying to replicate that again may have been a stretch. But in all seriousness, we, we have to figure out that students really have the capacity, but we don't have the patience. And if you put patience in with the work, we can galvanize this thing and really make it the way that it really should be. Jack Cassidy is now uh, retired, but the work that we put into TAF will last forever because Cincinnati Bell is still committed. Uh, it doesn't matter who the CEO is. It doesn't matter who the principal is. It matters that the students are still the students. And so uh, anytime a partnership wants to knock on the door of one of my schools, I'm responsible for all of the high schools in Cincinnati Public. I asked a very tough question. Are you willing to take the lowest grade group all the way through to graduation? And if you're not that committed, then this is not the right place for you. If, there, if the school starts at seventh grade, you take the seventh grade students all the way through that term. If it starts at ninth, you take ninth graders all right through that term. And of course, some of our schools are K to 12, and if that's what you wanna do, then you take a kindergarten student all the way through that term. Because you can't jump in and out of students' lives, you have to be committed for the long haul. Because they are there, they come every day. So here's my challenge, and here's a study that uh, we performed at TAF. Students who come to school every day don't have discipline issues, they don't have profound learning disabilities, but they're failing. That's a very different kid, because usually you want to use one of those markers to say this is what the struggle is, but there are no real, uh, real pieces to say that this is what the struggle is. The struggle is sometimes how we put kids in vacuums and expect them to perform and be outstanding at, uh, in, in, the, in the world of education. We can't do it. The individual academic plans are absolutely necessary for students to, to, to thrive. You must be able to figure out where the students are academically in order for them to grow. Uh, the state now says students need four years of math. We're now converting all of our high schools to make sure they are seven through 12. Every student will have an intro to algebra, algebra one at eighth grade, and we will move through that spectrum so that they are, they are rare, uh, very prepared for higher ed. Higher ed is screaming at us often uh, because of the remedial courses that take up a lot of students' tuition and, and, and time and money. And so we have to make sure that we are preparing students for the 21st century, not just college, but college and careers. So if you have any questions about what happened to Taft, um, you, you look like a very, very smart group. I have 94 slides, but I know that I couldn't get through 94 in three minutes, so uh, I can come back at another time or I can email you the information and you can see how it really worked. The school is still operational, the school is still functional, the school is still outstanding because they have made it very, very uh, committed effort to figure out who their leader is going to be and how they can help students move into this whole spectrum called education reform. Thank you so much and we will accept your offer of the 94 slides and make sure that it is distributed and that it's also added to the uh, uh, to all the material that the Commission will be drawing on as it uh, considers its recommendations. And we appreciate, again, you making the trip to be with us. The Commission uh, did review uh, the, um, the public agenda report about the uh, needles in the haystack, the high-performing schools in the state, and heard from so far two of those schools, and now we've heard from uh, a third of the schools that were identified uh, in, that, in that report. I wanted to make sure that we reference back to that report and know that Taft High was one of those schools identified. Madam Chair. I just really wanted to, to apologize, uh, especially uh, having made the trip here. We, we so much appreciate This is enormously important work, and you are uh, doing fantastic things. And the fact that you're willing to, to come here and help share that with us, we very much appreciate it. I feel very badly that, uh, I know all of us too, that um, you've done so much preparation, get a, didn't get a chance really to talk with us, but um, I hope we'll um, uh, follow up on this. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just wondering if you could describe very quickly the, the structure of the partnership that you had, that Taft had with Cincinnati Bell. I mean, I think that, that the business partnership would be, I would be really interested in hearing. Well, one of, the, one of the first components, we had to figure out why, why uh, the students were not engaged in education. Uh, many students aren't. And so what we did is we 
brought in the, uh, they were called Cincinnati Bell Tutors, that's, and they were really scheduled to be mentors of young people. Uh, these were people that were working in the upper management echelon. They were the attorneys and they were the system analysts. They were people that had that layer. And each one of those uh, employees picked a particular student, worked with them for the entire year. Uh, they tutored and they mentored during the course of the instructional day. Uh, if you want to really make it um, apparent of who's struggling in, in, in school, uh, you create a problem where you have tutoring at the end of the day because it just points a finger at every student who's struggling. And so we made the tutoring during the instructional period and the students that the um, tutors were actually picked up by caravan by the employee system and they were dropped off at the school and they had the instructional time with the students every day for uh, three hours, uh, three times a week. Uh, the commitment from Bell was enormous because not one tutor missed an assignment in eight years. And so that's where you have the real uh, bang for the buck, uh, so to speak, where the commitment was, was already laid out by the CEO. And for partners, uh, for schools who are trying to engage in this partnership, it's very apparent that uh, the CEO or the person in the top light or the top position of the organization has to be involved. Tierney. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question for Steve um, and also just as it relates to kind of United Way. So, you know, with uh, Janet and the work that's done at United Way, we as the business community invest in United Way and they're committed to outcomes. So I was curious, especially maybe with Indianapolis or with Chicago, there's been significant money raised, sounds like, by the business community. Who is the money going to? Who is holding that, those dollars? And are there, are there outcome measurements or for the business community? Is there, uh, there is a hope for a return on their investment? Or how is that? And maybe it's community by community, but I'm just curious how that's working. It's certainly community by community, but um, one thing that is clear is that many of these, for example, in Chicago, there's the um, public fund public education fund and it there's a board of business people and community people and the public sector on it they raised the money uh, I think they've raised over a hundred million dollars and they targeted to these goals you know an important thing and I think for for every one of us that um, give money to churches and to the United Way and to other important entities an important element of this is alignment in the community and um, Janet Jackson has been a leader in trying to align spending with goals uh, here in Columbus but you know how do we make sure that we've got our business money um, our, our foundation money and, and public money lined up towards important goals to build that capacity for change and very quickly with our work um, in terms of what's beneath our goals we use evidence-based strategies for results if you want if you're an agency and you want dollars from United Way, you must use those strategies in your work, and we can then measure across programs because we hold the agencies and their programs accountable, we hold ourselves accountable. And so we actually report out to the community. Uh, and this has been a very challenging thing for many organizations to accept, but quite frankly, when I am meeting with a prospective donor or investor, I say to them, it is my job to bring a return on investment to the dollar that you bring with us. And that's now our business model. Any other questions for the panel? Just one quick one. Yeah, just, sorry, Mr. Smith. Um, so you talked about the mentoring program and the involvement with the, with, um, with the business community. Um, was there an implicit understanding of a postgraduate hiring, how it, was, was there sort of Absolutely. an ongoing flow? Uh, many of the students, um, one of the things that the CEO did not want to happen, he did not want the students to leave the high school and be hired by Bell. He wanted them to have a post-secondary opportunity. And so those were the prerequisites. Uh, there were jobs available, but that was not our work. Our work was not to have them graduate from high school and have a lower entry job it was so that they could have some other opportunities so that they could be on the management team and be part of his executive group. 
Uh, one of the students in particular that I mentored is actually the assistant principal of the school now. So it's, it's moving. And also for Mr. Smith, just very quickly, what plans might be in place to replicate your success in Cincinnati um, beyond the single school? Well, that's why the superintendent made me the assistant superintendent. Because we are, we are moving very quickly to uh, use the same model in all of our high schools. Uh, one of the things that we realize high schools, well, all of our schools have a partnership. Some of the partnerships are only by name. There is really no strategy involved. So my job is to make sure there is a strategic effort in place to make sure that those partnerships are sustainable. Um, some schools have made some big mistakes with partnerships where they ask them for dollars the very first day they meet. That's not wise. You should ask them for assistance. And the, in the last part, uh, some schools have had partnerships for many years, but the partnerships don't understand what the educational strategies are. And just because you are a school that uh, has some educational problems, it doesn't mean that that partnership will fit. So I am sort of like the gateway to make sure that when partners want to come to a particular school, I may say that that may not be a fit. And it's not meaning go away. It just means that we don't need uh, any more donuts for dads and muffins for moms. Over here. I'm sorry. Okay. Does Taft operate on a lottery basis or can any student who wants to attend go to Taft? That's a good question. Uh, we made it very, very clear that we did not want to become a magnet school. It is a school where uh, first come, first serve. That is the way that it will be. That's the plans. Those are the plans that are written in the school uh, doctrine for the next 10 years. And so there's a, a limit on how many the school can accommodate. But the school can only take 760 students, and it is always at capacity. Thank you. I kind of want to make a recommendation now. I, I, I'm, I'm, a little, I'm so disappointed that I didn't get to hear your full presentation because I know that um, around our community, some of our agencies and businesses are already thinking of ways that they can help. And so I want to make sure that, or see if there's some way we can come up with to, for them to give us those recommendations because I don't want to say the agency because it was in the incubator stage and I don't want to get in trouble, but one of them um, had al already started um, accessing the data that they had 13,000 of our students that they serviced for their um, at this agency and was trying to figure out what kind of incentives they can give to those families to make sure that they um, the students start working harder on um, more academics. So my question to you is, um, how did you, how did that relationship or that partnership come about? Did they just contact you and ask, you know, this is how we want to help? Or how did you reach out to them or how did they reach out to you? Well, to be honest, because you may meet him one day, I really didn't like the, the CEO very much when I first met him. Mm -hmm. Because we were sitting at a round table with the CBC, Cincinnati Business Community, with all the business execs. And there was one chair available, and I sat in the chair. Uh, he asked me who I was. It was my second week on the job, and I told him that I was the principal of Taft, and he uh, kindly whispered in my ear, do you know that's the worst school in the state? And uh, I understood, and so I tried to pretend like I didn't hear him. And uh, he came back again and said, you know, that's one of the worst schools in the state. And so... Um, you can imagine being there, being the principal for two weeks, and you're getting this CEO uh, that makes a million dollars letting you know that you are in, responsible for the worst school in the state. And so he, uh, he's a smoker, and he said, well, can you, you want to step outside? And I thought that was my opportunity to maybe this was going to get become very interesting. <laughs> and so um, he asked me, did I want to partner with him? And I didn't really think he was serious because I'd given the background on the school. And I invited him the next day. And we start walking around talking about why this was not the right academic setting for students. And so that spring, uh, he, uh, it was just a big rally where 700 people from his company came in and painted the entire school in a weekend. 
and put in new blinds, uh, new technology, I mean all sorts of great things. So uh, the kids really realized that here was someone who did not have to walk through the doors, but here was someone who was very committed. And so the next phase of it, uh, students who earned a 3.3 or higher uh, got the use of a cell phone with uh, unlimited uh, opportunities. And then uh, the students started talking to him about other technology and other uh, forms of advancement. So now it's set up students who earn a 3.4. Um, they have the use of an uh, electronic device, a cell phone with unlimited calls, unlimited texts. They also get a laptop uh, for their use. Uh, they all, there is also an internship where 20 students are selected every summer to work with the Bell executives and they earn $5,000 over that summer period. There's also uh, 25 scholarships at $20,000 each uh, for uh, 25 students, the top 25 students in the class. Um, and the interns and the partnerships and the uh, mentors come to the graduation, they come to the prom, they come to the athletic events. So it's now a, a culture that's been uh, totally uh, revised based on one person with a vision saying we can do better in this community. Bravo. Yes. Oh. Phenomenal. Yeah, Wonderful. Nick. Any Kath other questions? I do. Carol? Yeah, I'm on. Thank you. Um, my question is, at, um, what is the composition of your Board of Education? Are they elected or are they appointed? And uh, as Assistant Superintendent, what's your working relationship with your board? Let me look around in here first. <laughs> okay. Now, the board is actually an elected board. Um, some of them have been there for several years. They are, it's a very, very nice group of people to work with simply because they really believe that every child can learn, but not just learn, but at the higher end of Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, I have conversations with them on a regular basis because they sit on various committees, and some of those committees uh, I am uh, a part of. What, what's the uh, what's the ranking under the state report card, and uh, where do you stand in last week's um, annual yearly progress uh, as ranked by the state for, as, a, as a school district? For the, as a school district, we are in continuous improvement. Eric, where do they rank in your your? I'm chart? not sure. I'll, I'll have to get it to you. Yeah, be interesting but to see. I mentioned they, they are the highest of the age figure. Right. And primarily what's going on now, and the reason we're shifting from K to 8 to 7 to 8, is 7 to 12, is uh, K to 8 in our schools, our teachers have done a fabulous job, but they are generalists in those particular domains. And so we thought it was going to be very apparent that our students get a chance to start working with people who majored in those content areas. Uh, for the most part, our elementary students are doing okay, but our high school students are actually carrying the bulk of our success across the district. Any other questions? Let's thank our panel. Uh, before we wrap uh, things up, we've had a request from uh, Ms. Lois Carson that uh, she's going to share thoughts with us. Thank you. This morning, uh, Judge Marbley spoke about a research paper that my union has compiled, and you guys have it all in your booklet. And I asked, after speaking and learning today more about governance, mayors, elected boards, that you do take the time to look over the booklet. It's um, white paper is a consummate and detailed look at various school governance experiments which have been implemented across the country and how they have failed urban school children. Now it's clear in this research that depriving us of our elected rights kind of eliminates us having a choice with our boards, but all of us sitting here today on this commission together with Michael, Mayor Coleman, agree that we do need to move and make changes in educating our children, especially those children facing the greatest obstacles to achievement. That's why we're all here, I believe. 
We need everyone involved, not like the gentleman said, not temporarily. We need a commitment, a full-time commitment. We don't need continue in the door, out the back door. We need a full commitment. And if we are gonna do this, we have to do this together as a community, as a group, and work on improving teaching and learning that enhances the schools, the home, and the community involvement. So I just ask that together you, we really do come together on this issue. You take a moment to look at our research. It does talk about some of the things that aren't working because today we've heard about all the things that are working. But if we're gonna be true in giving our recommendations, we have to look at the good and the bad. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Um, anyone else have anything you'd like to add before we adjourn? I know you would. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, I just want to say that um, I really appreciate the conversation that was today and how um, we put all adult problems aside and we focused on kids. It, it really it makes me feel good to know that we're moving forward in a positive way and, and um, with kids first in mind. And, um, but I do want to make sure that we figure out a way that we can because there's so many, maybe I can eat my lunch because people are just coming up to me sharing all the things that they want to do and how they want to be involved. Maybe we can figure out a way to allow them to, to send us that information because, um, you know, it's very important and in the end, it'll be a part of our recommendation. And if we're saying that we want buy-in, then we need to hear what their buy-in is, um, you know, how they want to be involved. Thank you. Madam Chair, Mr. I, 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 I made sorry. one mistake. Principal Smith, Assistant Superintendent Smith's exactly. uh, materials are already up on our website. Okay. And by no means do I want to inhibit your questions. I'm just teasing you, okay? You know that. Anything else? I'm Allison Rogers, and I'm from Franklin County Children's Services, and my director, Chip Spinning, had to step out, so he gives his regrets about that. But I'm glad to have had the opportunity just to have been here today to hear part of the conversation and to be thinking more about op opportunities that we have as an agency as we partner with the Columbus City School. So thank you. Okay, well, um, i just like to thank everybody for um, a meeting that was uh, highly anticipated. And I think, um, again, I think we all, uh, we all got a lot out of this and I commend us for uh, the manner in which we've handled things. With that said, do I have a, a request for adjournment? We're adjourned. Thank you.